we'll love the Lord together. Hallelujah, we love you, Lord.
been so good. You've been so faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh.
Fill us with your love. Everybody say, lift your hands to heaven right now and say, Lord, fill us with your love. Fill us, Lord. Fill us until we overflow, Lord. Broken vessels, oh God, that cannot contain, can only be a channel to which your love flows, Lord. Thank you, God, for the strength you give us. We couldn't live this life without you, Lord. It is the power of your spirit, oh God, that makes a difference. It's your love flowing through us, Lord. When I first fell in love with Jesus, remember the time? I gave him all my heart, hallelujah. And I thought I couldn't love him more than I did right at the start. But when I look back over the mountains and all those valleys where we've been, well, it makes me know.
Some of you heard it this morning, and some of you might not have. So we're going to. Uh... Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. So for the people that weren't here, I'm Haley. I'm a first year student, and I am from the Miramichi. Um, so first, I want to start off by thanking Pastor Gavin and his wife for allowing me to speak and tell my testimony because it. It's really hard to do that, but it, I know it can speak to somebody. Um, so basically, when I was born, um, I was born with really bad nerves, and I couldn't do nothing. There were so many obstacles that I faced in my life because there was nothing that I could do. There was all these things that stood in the way of me doing things, like I couldn't go nowhere without my mother beside me. And I went to a youth camp in 2018, and I didn't know how I was going to do it. I went there, and I was so nervous. I wouldn't even talk to anybody. But um, there was a pastor there, and he told me that he felt that anxiety on me. I mean, he prayed for me instantly. I felt a change, and Praise the anxiety God. was gone. I've never had that problem again in my life, so I thank God for that. Um, after that, I went through through my school from grade 6 to grade uh, 10, probably. I was bullied just constantly every day, and that really affected my mental health. That It affected me so much. And um, it got to the point where I didn't feel like doing nothing. And then one Sunday, well, one Saturday, my parents were like, we shouldn't go to church t tomorrow. And we just feel like not going. And so we didn't bother going. And then the next week, I said the same thing. And then that turned into us quitting church completely. So I was out of church at the time. And I felt so broken and lost because I knew that God was there. But I also knew that there was something standing in the way from allowing me to reach his presence. And this whole time, there was a verse that stuck with me, and it's Jeremiah 20, 29 and 11. And it says, For I know the thoughts that I have, that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So after a little while, I was in my room on Saturday night, and I felt strongly that God was speaking to me. And I, I kind of pushed it off. I was like, I'm probably just tired, but... I went out and I told my parents I feel we should go back to church and ever since that day we've been back into church and I thank God for that. Um, after that I started to seek God more. I actually started a P7 group in my school and I was doing good and then I got, I experienced God talking to me for the first time and it was him telling me to go to NCC and I thought that it was just me losing my mind because I see myself, I was like, I'm not qualified to go there. I look at the students there, and they're all so spiritual, and they're on this another level, and then there's me way down here. And I tried to run from the calling. I tried to find different schools that I could go to and avoid the calling of God. Um, 
and it came to a month before or so that I was going to go, and I felt that I wasn't, I didn't want to go, and the devil was tormenting me, and I, I was saying this morning, um, I was sitting there one night, and I had plans to go out and drinking with friends, and it was weird because I, I was talking to someone from the church about it, and they really, like, they didn't really know what to tell me because I wasn't listening to them either. And um, I didn't bother going. And then the next morning, my mom came up to me and she told me everything. She told me that she knew where I was going and who I was going with and everything, and I haven't told her a thing. So I know that that was God, and that was God letting her know that he ha she has to watch me because I was going to do something that was really going to affect my future. Um, fast forward to a week before school, I wasn't going to go. I was going to call them and tell them that I was not showing up. I wasn't going to start going to Bible school. And the devil fought me so bad, but I decided that I was going to try it. And the first day came, and I, I sat in my room, and I cried all day. I'm pretty sure, because I knew nobody, and I felt I felt so low and so lost there, because I just felt like I wasn't qualified or fit in there. Um, but then I met some amazing people there, and it really changed my life so much. I, I can say today that I'm not the person that I was even a month ago. And um, I'm so glad that his mercy and goodness is for everybody, no matter the circumstances that you face. And he see me at my lowest, so he could take me out of the grip of hell and to put me into um, his marvelous light. And I just want to say that God sees you. It doesn't matter what you've done or what, you, what you're thinking about doing. Um, his um, goodness is for everybody, and there's no one that he can't reach. Um, he loves you, and his goal isn't to set you up for failure, but his goal is to um, make you a willing vessel and to put your past into a testimony for yourself. Thank you. Great so, we are going to sing a song, and um, I don't want this to be another song. I want um, you guys to worship and connect with God while we sing this song, because we serve a God that works miracles, Amen. and there's nothing that's too hard for him. Amen. Amen.
Wasn't that an amazing job? Amen. You offer up a hand clap of praise in this place. It's good to be home. I always love being home. Love being able to see my family, spend time with my with my siblings, with my dad and my stepmom. Love being able to see my friends. I'm glad to see two of my closest friends, two of my oldest friends here today. It's been a while, too long. Um, Brother Yon, before you get too far, uh, could you open us in prayer? Father, we're just so thankful for your sweet presence that is in this place. We pray, God, for liberty for Brother Tyler to bring forth your word and anointing, oh God, and that you will just capture each of our hearts, oh Lord, and grasp our attention and minister to us and have your way, we pray, in every life. Everybody sit in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I remember when I was uh, when I was a lot younger, I used to love going and getting the cardboard boxes in the house, and I'd make something out of them. Sometimes it was a spaceship. Sometimes it was something we had cats whenever I lived in Maine, and make a little house for them to run around in. Now we see Malachi, and he's drawn all over cardboard boxes and makes different submarines from show Octonauts. <laughs> Loves that show. And I remember one time I tried to uh, make the armor of God wanted to make a full replica. I, was, I remember making the shoes a piece. I actually cut out little feet, little sandals, and wrote peace on them. And I remember trying to make the belt of truth. I don't remember if that actually worked or not. And I don't think I ever got any further than that. I think I got frustrated. <laughs> I remember I had this little kid's study Bible that I was using to go through the whole thing. Right now, uh, my roommate is using it. So <laughs> it's back at the dorms. I think I looked through Ephesians when I was a kid because it's only six chapters long. No, nice and short. I was only like four or five, so short read. And around at the same time, my dad had a book about raising his sons like a knighthood, which I'm sure inspired the creation of the armor. And I wanted to make the full set. So with that, I'd ask that you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Say amen when you have it. And it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul is closing his letter to the church at Ephesus and is encouraging them to be strong, not of their own strength, but strong in the Lord and the power of God's might. It isn't our strength, but God's strength in us. The Bible says in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. So how can we be strong in the Lord? How can we live with his might working in us and through us? In verse 11, so it's put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Another translation. Another translation is, it says that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So if we want to have the full strength of God, if we want to have the strength of God working in our lives and his power in our lives, we need to put on the full armor of God. Paul seems to really like the comparison of healthy Christians and a healthy church to that of the Roman army. He lived in Rome and he ministered all throughout the Roman Empire and he was able to see them firsthand. When he wrote the book of Ephesians, he was in prison surrounded by them and he compared their armor to how we should arm ourselves against the schemes of the devil. But we need to put on the whole armor of God. If you only put on some armor, you're going to leave yourself vulnerable. There are going to be weak spots. I watched a documentary not too long ago about the armor development of samurais, because I'm geeky like that and I love samurais and ninjas and all that stuff. I don't care how old I am. <laughs> but they had elaborate stages starting hundreds of years before the final product. And every time that they made an armor, there was always some flaw with it. It was too heavy or it had a, an obvious weak spot. And so with the next generation of armor, they tried to fix this as best they could, and they got better and better with their armor. But with each time, each, to, each set of armor that they came and they made, there was a hole in it, and they wanted to patch it up so that there were no weaknesses. They didn't want to leave their enemies any spot to get to, any weak point, any 
any place that they could exploit to get at them. We need to put on the whole armor, God's armor, which has no weaknesses, so we can withstand the wiles of the devil, so we can withstand his schemes and his plans. Notice it says that you may be able to stand. When you put on the armor, it doesn't force you into a standing position. We need to put on the armor, but more than that, we need to choose to stand and make use of it. We'll get to that later. In verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The church was under persecution in the early centuries. In the first and second centuries after Christ's death, there was a lot of upheaval. There was a lot of the Romans not wanting the Christians to be established as a legitimate religion. There was a lot of persecution. There was a lot of people that died for the faith. They had their neighbors and their friends come against them because of their belief in, of their belief in Christ. And as Pastor said this morning, persecution comes because the enemy knows that you're getting strong. Because he knows you're becoming a threat. But Paul tells this church in Ephesus that we aren't fighting against one another, that we aren't fighting against people who are coming against us, against any family or friends that might come against us, against our beliefs. That's not who we're fighting. We're not fighting flesh and blood. But rather, we're fighting against a spiritual enemy. We're fighting against principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual weakness in high places, against the influence of the devil and against his work against his schemes in this world. And when knights don their armor, or samurai, or Vikings, or anyone else, our modern day soldiers, they put on their gear and they head to the battlefront. But on, their, on, their, on the whole, they're not going for their own glory. They're not going just to glorify themselves or to fight just for their own sakes, but they go because of their family and their friends and their loved ones back home. When my dad strapped on a helmet and went overseas, he didn't just go over because he had to or because in the military, he didn't just go over to defend himself. But he went over to defend me, he went over to defend his family, he went over to defend his country, his friends and his beliefs. Both on behalf of the people that loved him and the people that hated him. Likewise, our warfare isn't with those around us. It's not with the people who come against us, who fight against our beliefs but rather with the spirit behind that. It's against the devil who is influencing this world and fighting against us, fighting against our own salvation. When we go to war, because Christianity, it's, it's a warfare. If you're going to believe in Christ, you're going to war. You go to war against the devil. He doesn't want you believing in that. He doesn't want you to be saved. But when we go to war as Christians, as children of God, we don't fight against these people who come against us. We fight for them. In verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Again, we need the whole armor of God. It doesn't matter that you have your helmet on if the enemy's aiming at your chest. And it doesn't matter that you have your chest plate on when they're looking down the shaft of an arrow at your head. We need this armor on to be able to stand up against the enemy, to stand in persecution, to be able to stand up against the enemy when he comes to attack you and your family. Going back to verse 12, you need to have the armor on so you can fight when the enemy comes to attack you. When he comes to attack you through your family, when he comes to attack you through your friends, when he comes to attack you through those around you. When you feel like you're fighting all alone and no one seems to be on your side, and even when your family and friends, your heroes, those who look up to you suddenly turn and fight against you. You need to have this armor on so you can still be found standing in that evil day, at the end of that evil day. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. At first glance, the belt doesn't seem too important with the armor. It doesn't protect a whole lot. I've seen some pretty thick belts on some people, a lot of pop stars, they wear a belt about a foot thick, WWE. But the majority of belts and the belts used in most armies aren't that thick. It doesn't seem to protect a whole lot. But if you're in the middle of war and you don't have your belt on, you're gonna be caught with your pants down. <laughs> we need to know the truth. You aren't gonna be asked to quote the Bible cover to cover whenever you get to the gates of heaven. 
but we need to have some basic truths in our lives as Christians. Amen. Without this belt, it's difficult to keep your pants or skirt up, to be in the middle of the battlefield with your legs open to attack, and you can't run to fight anymore. And if you do try to run with them, you're going to have to stop and pull, pull your pants up and occupy one hand. One hand's going to be busy hiking up your pants. And in war, you're going to need access to both hands. Without the truth, you're always going to be distracted. You're always going to be pulled aside by other things. You're not going to be able to defend yourself. You're not going to be able to actually run into the battle, but you're always going to be stopped up on some distraction. You're always going to be stopped up because you don't have the truth. And the breastplate of righteousness is just as important. The breastplate protects all of your vital organs. It covers your lungs. It covers your, your liver, your stomach, and your kidneys. And it covers your heart. It shields you from the enemy's attacks. The majority of attacks are going to come against your vital organs. They're going to come against your heart. When you have the breastplate of righteousness, God's righteousness over your life, you're protected. Your vital organs are protected. The enemy can't get at you there. In verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to put on our shoes. Put on the gospel of peace. Some of my friends will know I like to go down to a particular friend's house of mine during the summer. It's down by the lake. We like to go swimming, tubing, goofing off, pushing each other into the water. But we'll get our swim clothes on. And the smarter of us will put on our sandals and our flip-flops. And the rest of us will go down in their bare feet. But as you get to the water, it's not sand like a lot of other beaches. It's not soft dirt. It's not even mud. It's a whole lot of gravel. And I have this particular ability to explain in detail the pain of those rocks coming up to meet my foot. But to simplify, I'll just say it hurt. A battlefield is a lot less welcoming even than the gravel that I have to run across to get to the water. I'm going to try to wear my flip-flops this summer. But a battlefield is going to have broken weapons lying around. It's going to have spears sticking up out of the earth and arrows dug down into the earth. Broken pieces of armor. And perhaps just the ground is rough. The rocks, the roots, holes in the ground that you can trip and fall into. And without your shoes on, it's not like you're going to be able to walk across that in pain. You're not going to be able to get anywhere at all. We can't get anywhere without having the gospel or the good news of peace. Wherever we go, we need to take that with us or else we're not going to be able to go anywhere at all. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. But why does Paul say above all here? A shield can temporarily stand in for a missing piece of armor, like your helmet or breastplate. Soon you're going to have to put that on, but in the moment it can protect you for a short while. But more importantly, a shield has another purpose. When Paul was writing this, as I said, he was in the prisons at Ephesus. He was surrounded by Roman soldiers. He knew how they worked. He knew their formations. He knew how the military in Rome worked. And in Roman armies, the shield wasn't, protect, wasn't designed to protect the user. But when Roman armies fell into formation, they formed human tanks with the spears sticking out and the shield at their side, or if they're in the front, their shield off to one side, because the shield was designed to protect the person beside you. Your shield, while it isn't enough to save those around you, can get between them and the attack of the enemy. Paul said that this shield allows us to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. It doesn't matter what they're throwing at you. Your faith and your testimony can get in the way of that for a short while. The enemy lights his arrows with the flames of hell to fire at you. It says the fiery darts of the wicked. He wants to share that fire with us. He doesn't want to go down into that alone. He wants to bring us down with him. So he's shooting at me. He's shooting at you. He's shooting at your friends and your family. And your shield can get in between them and the darts, if you have your faith. It can get between them long enough for them to put their own armor on. It can stop the darts of the enemy while they're busy putting on their shoes till they're busy putting on their belt, they're busy putting on their helmet, they're busy putting on their armor. It can get between them long enough. It's not going to take them anywhere. 
They can't walk on your shield. They can't strap on your shield like a Santa and walk across the battlefield. But I can get between them long enough to give them time to put their armor on. It could get between them and the attacks. Then it could be get between your husband and alcohol. It could get between a young lady and suicide. It could get between the whispers of guilt and depression in the ears of your mom and daughter. It could get between your best friend and going to a bad place, going to a party, or going and doing something they shouldn't. It can get between the enemy and them. And that's why, above all, we need to carry our shield of faith, not for our own sake, not to protect ourselves, but for the sake of our friends and our family, our lost loved ones. They depend on our faith. They need us to be a light to them. They need our faith to get between them and the attacks of the enemy because they can't defend themselves. We need to stand in that gap and shield them, to be an example for them, so they have time to put on their armor, so they have time to take up the fight themselves, to pick up their own shield and help someone else. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. All it takes is one good hit on the head to cause damage that will sustain for years. As a lot of you know, someone close to me, someone close to my family was in a car accident. And while there are plenty of injuries, the one that left the most damage, the most long-lasting damage, was damage to his head, to his brain. Whenever our heads are hurt, we can lose parts of ourselves. Some people have amnesia, and they forget who they were. Some people have permanent damage, and they'll never be who they were again. Well, we need to protect our vital organs, our lungs and our heart, and the others. When they take damage, they'll heal, and they leave you as a person as you are. But they heal a whole lot easier than our heads. The enemy will attack your salvation more than anything else. He wants to inspire doubt wants you to forget your salvation, to forget who you are. He wants you instead to only be able to focus on your failures, on the times that you messed up, on the times that you didn't quite live up to who you say you are, who you think you are, who you should be. He wants you to focus on that, on your sinful past, maybe what you did last week or last month, maybe yesterday or earlier today. But he wants to attack you for that and make you forget who you are, make you forget that you're a child of the king, to make you forget that you are an heir to the throne, to make you forget that you are saved in Jesus Christ. He wants to attack your salvation so that you don't remember that anymore, but instead you live in your own guilt, in your own fear, in your own doubt. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation and a peculiar people. The devil wants us to forget that. He wants us to forget that we are a royal priesthood, that we have been elected by God, that we are royals and that we are sons of the king, sons and daughters of the king. When you wear a helmet, your vision is affected by it. Anybody here ever worn a helmet before? We used to have some in our history class, we used to try them on. My friends know. We had some from World War II in my social studies class. You put them on, it's heavy and it's hot, and it blocks out part of your vision. It changes the way you see things. But the helmet of salvation, it does change your vision, but it doesn't limit it. Instead, it allows us to see through the filter of God's perception, allows us to see our identity in Him. That we are saved, that we are children of the risen King. It protects us from the lies of the enemy, and it protects, him, protects us from the enemy destroying our identity. If we can go back to that verse in Ephesians uh, 17, 17, chapter 6. and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When we wear armor to go to war, we aren't going to war just to stand in the way. We aren't going to war just to get beat up. We aren't going there just to put on armor and protect ourselves and survive the onslaught. We're not there just to survive the attacks of the enemy. We go to fight back. When we go to war, we go so we take the enemy to them. We get the fight off of the home front. And if we're going to fight back, we need something to fight back with. We need a weapon. Paul says that, that weapon that we are given is the word of God, the sword. We have a responsibility to take up our own swords 
and to fight the darkness, to cut down the enemy that Paul outlined earlier, principalities, dark powers in high places, and evil spirits. The sword is the word of God, it's scripture and prophecy, it's promises of God, it's the gospel. The enemy can't stand against that. You've heard it before when the devil's trying to tell you about all your failures and all your past. When he's trying to tell you where you came from, you just tell him where he's going. Amen. The word of the Lord says that we have a kingdom set up for us in heaven. It says that he went to prepare a place for us. And it says that the enemy shall be cast down to the pits of hell forever. In verse 18. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for saints. This is as a continuation of verse 17. We need to pray. When we speak the name of Jesus, the enemy trembles. He's afraid. When we speak the word of God, when we pray the word of God, when we pray in God's will, he's afraid. He can't stay in that place anymore. He can't stay on that battlefield anymore. He can't keep attacking you. He can't keep attacking your friends. He can't keep attacking your family but he needs to run. In verse 19, and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. He's asking them to pray for him. We have an awesome pastor. He's my favorite preacher, my favorite pastor. I love Brother Gowan. And I look up to him in quite a few regards and a lot of respect having preached last week and then preaching again this week and then a couple other things I've done this week, I realize all the stuff that he has to go through. And Paul, likewise, he is a leader to the church in Ephesus. He'd been there with them for two years and he asked them to pray for him. Our pastor needs our prayer too. As strong as our pastor is and as close as his walk is with God, he needs our prayers and our support too. Yeah. Verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now our pastor isn't in prison. He's just back there behind the tape. It looks like bars, but it's just tape. <laughs> but Paul was in prison, but he was an ambassador of God, an ambassador of the gospel. Our pastor is an ambassador of God. He brings the gospel to us. He brings the word of the Lord to us. We need to pray for him that he can speak boldly. We need to pray for him, that he be, is able to speak as he ought to speak. Brother Gowan, I'm not sure how long, you, how long that was, but I hope it was long enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank God that I'm able to be here with y'all tonight. I love coming here. I thank y'all with your patience that you're able to listen to me. One day I hope I'm able to preach as well as our pastor. I love our pastor. Thank love the Lord and I'm so happy to be here and I thank God that I'm able to be here and spend this weekend here at church in my home church I love going to church in Fredericton and CCC but it's not quite the same as coming home Another preacher. Amen. 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 Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise, Praise God. Praise I'm just dusting off the keyboard. <laughs> Sanitizing. If we'd done this a year ago, even 13 months ago, you'd think, uh, man, there's something wrong with that guy. <laughs> He's got a phobia. But I don't. I'm just call following the rules. If there's anything here, it's killed in Jesus' name. Lord. Let's stand together. I really didn't pay him to say those kind of things. <laughs> I was thinking that, yeah, they just... <laughs> Tyler, I'll give you 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm grateful for victory, aren't you? Victory ahead. Victory ahead. Through the blood of Jesus. Victory ahead. Trusting in the Lord. By faith I see the victory ahead. Well, I see victory ahead. Victory ahead through the blood.
blood of Jesus, victory ahead. Trusting in the Lord, I hear the conqueror's prayer. By faith I see the victory ahead. There is victory ahead. And I see something in your saints at Cornerstone that you might not see in yourself. Hallelujah. God sees might and God sees strength. You're just going to have faith in God. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Thank you, Jesus. I guess we don't have those verses, do we? Just the, they're coming. When the hopes of Israel are in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. So Daniel prayed unto the Lord Christ each day. And you're going to pray. Then unto the lion's den led the way. He was trusting in the Lord. He did not fear or dread. By faith he saw a victory ahead. There is victory There's an army that's marching. Can you hear the footsteps? Hear those footsteps? Oh, we think oh, there's just about 75 or 80 of us here at Cornerstone. Hallelujah. But we're not all alone all around this world. There are people that are magnifying the name of the Lord. We're part of a great army. We cannot be defeated in victory. said, well, sometimes I'm my biggest enemy. Well, listen, sometimes pastor's his biggest enemy, because it's not always the devil. He, the devil gets blamed for everything. 
And sometimes, sometimes it's just our carnal self, right? Often with the carnal mind, I was tried. Maybe that's been you this week. Asking for deliverance, oft I cried. You know what the key is? Trust in the Lord. The key is having faith in God, amen? I reckoned I was dead. <laughs> Whoever wrote this song wasn't a southerner when he said, I reckon. But he said, I learned to view myself like I was a dead man. Amen? I'm dead and Christ is living in me. That's the key. Let Jesus live the life through you. Often with the kind of mind. side, hallelujah, the shouting that's going to be praising God, hallelujah, all our battles will be behind us, amen, hallelujah, I think we're still going to be singing about the victory, amen, hallelujah, we're going to be singing about the victory through the blood of Jesus, when life goes to God before, to in his word. Praise God. All you've got to do is put it on. Amen. You don't need to make the armor. You just need to put it on. God has provided. The Bible says everything that we need to live a victorious life. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Hallelujah. Victory. Victory shall be mine. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you tonight. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. And I just want to say that if you have given an offering or wanted to give an offering towards a family, a ministry family, um, in a couple provinces over, our brother has felt led upon, God laid it upon his heart. If you just mark that in an envelope and uh, we will forward that on to help them and bless them and surprise them that God has heard and answered their prayers. Amen. I tell you, when we were in Newfoundland a couple of years, there was a dear um, couple, several dear couples there, but the one in particular, she had four teenage boys. And you know how fast teenage boys can outgrow their clothes, their shirts and pants. And she prayed. She said, Lord, I don't have any. I, I need some clothes. God, you're going to have to provide. And God moved upon Brother Carol Carter. You all know Carol, Brother Carol Carter. He used to pastor in Charlottetown. And, and anyway, he's, um, he's pastored several different churches around. But he's retired. He's probably in his 80s now. But he's a man that hears from God. Down on his knees and God said, send a check to Sister Pollard. She needs to buy some clothes for her boys. Isn't that amazing? Amen. God knows where we're at. Amen. God cares for where we're at, and God's going to provide. Amen? I've never seen the righteous forsaken, David said. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Just keep serving God, trusting in the Lord. Amen? Whatever battles you have to face, you face them with Jesus. Amen? When the devil comes knocking at your door, send Jesus to answer. Amen? Don't you fight it on your own, but let him fight through you. Amen? God bless you, and have a wonderful week. We'll see you on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Everybody say amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, that means you. Be there. God bless you. Thanks for being in the house of the Lord. Kelsey, cousin, good to see you.